underestimated outcomes have divided the world. Are we in a new era where truth and facts are hollowed out by hysteria? In a world of 24-hour news and a wealth of information, separating fact from fiction is becoming increasingly difficult. How have we ended up in a place where falsities and half-truths have become the reality? It's a reflection of something deeper, which is the basic lack of authority or the decline of authority of institutions across the board. The things that defined our society, they were corporations, labor unions, a family, churches, uh, you know, uh, political parties. Every single one of those institutions has seen a decline in the number of people saying they trust those institutions. Not only social media giants are using big data. Political campaigners know exactly who to micro-target with what type of message. Does technology have implications for our democracy? I think actually technology plays a role because a lot of these institutions have actually become much, much more transparent. And when people actually see the way that they function in reality, they don't like it, uh, even though there's actually been no change. Our beliefs, whether based in fact or not, are reinforced through complex algorithms and spread throughout the social networks. When people are getting their news from social media, shouldn't their literacy include the skills to also evaluate information for authenticity and validity? Whether fake newsmakers are politically or financially driven, are fake news laws an appropriate countermeasure? J'ai décidé que nous allions faire évoluer notre dispositif juridique pour protéger la vie démocratique de ces fausses nouvelles. In a democratic society, freedom of expression is fundamental, but we also need facts, transparency, and the truth. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a panel of the WEF Open Forum. My name is Patrizia Larry. I'm the anchor of the Swiss Public Television. And I'm good to have honest people here on the podium at the panel, hopefully, to speak about this age of lies. And actually, um, on the one side, we have more the startup side and millennials, of course. And on the other side, we have government and established business side. And I would like to introduce to you, um, you may, everybody knows him, of course, like the president of the most democratic country in the world. <laughs> it's Alain Bersin. And he is also like federal councillor of home affairs in Switzerland. And he is a member of Socialist Party. And next to him, we have like Iqbal Surbe, businessman from South Africa is here. He's executive chairman of Secundialo Investment Group owning, among other companies, independent newspapers, which include the Cape Times and the Star. And he used to be like physician and is a former doctor of Nelson Mandela. And we like to welcome um, Pia, like the microphone put up here a little bit. And we would like to welcome Pia Mancini. And she's kind of rock star of the civic movement. And the civic movement tries to close the gap between establishment and voters digitally. And they consist mostly on non-profit startups. She developed technology for democracy around the world. She founded an open source platform, Demo Democracy OS, in Argentina. And she founded the party, the internet party in Argentina, um, Partido de la Red. And actually, she's based now in New York and is chair of the Democracy Earth Foundation. Welcome here. And next to here, um, we have Iman Usman. I think just turning 25 now, 26. or tw 26, okay, I made you even younger. So he's an edtech guru in Indonesia, he founded Ranguru.com, an award-winning tech-enabled education provider in Indonesia. Iman has co-founded and led some of the largest youth-led movements, 
in Indonesia, such as the Indonesia Future Leaders and the Indonesian Youth Parliament. So welcome. And last but not least, we have Mike Allen. And I welcome the probably best informed political journalist of the US here, delivering countless scoops from within the White House, and after leaving Politico, he has founded the media startup Axios, which serves short stories short enough to be fully read, not skimmed. <laughs> That's it. And he's enormously energetic as journalist and writer and sees himself as a savior of journalism. And so. I'm 27, <laughs> so a little older. <laughs> no, no quite. So welcome, everybody. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, could I just ask the audience quickly, has anybody ever been fooled by fake news? Hands up. Be honest. Not, not <laughs> lying here in San Francisco. <laughs> so I was... So, okay, so let's start with a little fake news warm-up test <laughs> for everybody of you. Can you tell fake news from real ones? So let's start, maybe from, for the e journalist, it's easiest. Let's maybe start with you, Mike Allen. Um, is it true or false? Putin issues international arrest warrant for George Soros. False. Yes. Okay. So, okay, maybe it was easy for you. So, and then, Iman Usman, next one for you, true or false? Texas Mosque refuses to help Hurricane Harvey survivors. Is it true or fake? True. It's fake. That's fake, all right. And <laughs> I follow. Three, Pia Mancini, police believe Venezuela sue animals stolen for food army crisis. What, what was that? The police... <laughs> But police believe Venezuela sue, sue animals stolen for food amid crisis. Is it true or false? That's true. It's true. Unfortunately, it's true. Then Iqbal Surve for so, something for you. Harambe, a dead gorilla, got over 15,000 votes for president of the United States. Is false. it true or fake? False, I think. False. Yeah, correct. Okay. Good. And it was like, and the last but not least one from Ale Perse. In Macedonia have been launched over 100 US politics websites publishing sensationalist and false pro Trump content. True or false? True. True. Oh, you're really doing good, very good. In most test readers could only identify like half of the news. Yeah. As a millennial, I'm probably the easy one to be fooled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's really hard. So um, let's dive into discussion now, the serious part of it. Um, we would like to divide the talk in two parts. First part, um, to to look at uh, threats and risks concerning misinformation and fake news. And the second part would be about the solutions, more about constructive ideas, how to tackle that. So we have like five people from five different countries here. Just to summarize, um, is or are fake news and misinformation a problem in your country. And since we will have like um, regional and presidential uh, elections in Indonesia, um, Iman, we start with you. Are they a problem in Indonesia? Sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Iman. Um, so just to give a bit of context of Indonesia, so Indonesia is the fourth largest, um, you know, um, country in the world, most populous country in the world. As the most populous Muslim country in the world, we have 260 million people uh, in the country, and there are 300, um, over 500 regions. And this year is particularly exciting um, and also uh, interesting for Indonesia because over 170 regions in the country will have um, direct election. So we will select um, governor and mayors. And in the past, I think in the last um, few years, we have seen you know, how many uh, politicians have overused digital media um, uh, for the short-term benefit of winning election. And that leads to um, 
uh, you know, to the explosion of fake news, which later on uh, leads to, um, you know, div uh, division within the communities. So people just believe uh, what they see and what they hear without really, um, you know, double checking the information. Um, for me, uh, I think in, in, in particular, um, Indonesia is very interesting because I think unlike many, you know, many um, European countries or, or probably in the U.S. where um, fake news uh, are spread mostly through, you know, uh, like formal media or even to fancy technology like bot and all that. But in Indonesia, uh, fake news are spread uh, particularly through um, uh, chat groups, um, messaging app, um, and then um, and then also uh, Facebook. So it is really based on the people that you know. So that's that is I think more dangerous because then you somewhat believe what you know what but what what people will say to you because it's coming from someone that you trust, someone that you know. Um, it's kind of different from you know like getting information from from you know the media that maybe you have some curiosity. But if you get information from the people that you know, then uh, typically you believe it, and then. For me, uh, it, it, it is it is it is just um, dangerous. And then and then what is uh, what is also uh, interesting is that it's not only just about the personal pers personality. It's not just only uh, fake news about you know one or two percent, but fake news has been used, particularly during the election season, to target uh, hate to certain target audience. Uh, so we we have seen basically you know a lot of division within the communities. And even it's not just between the people who are you know different in terms of religion or in terms of race. But even within the, the family, so for instance, um, I'm coming from a big family. I have five sisters and no brother. And just because I say my mother was fooled by the fake news, we can fight, you know, about it. And 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 we, we can take it to macro level. It's, it's really micro in a family, but in macro level, it like we see people unfriend, you know, on Facebook. People, uh, you know, even um, send uh, hate message, death threat, and and all that. So I think that's quite concerning for me. So you say it's an explosion of fake news and it's dangerous. What does it mean for the election? I mean, is this like Islamic extremist groups that gain like relevance? Like, I think what I've seen is that um, there is a tendency. You know, if we we would like to generalize that there are two groups basically. So those who are more religious and those who are more, I think, uh, moderate, right? And I think um, for the concept conservativists, they're still like very afraid that the moderate will take a lead, and that that is why they're trying to basically, um, you know. Uh, bury these, these, these people with, with basically a lot of uh, fake news against the personality of the uh, of, of those people. So, for instance, um, maybe they can say, oh, that person is, is, is gay or this person is lesbian. And because coming from Indonesia, those things are still, you know, seen as something that is, that is not common. So people take it very seriously. Or maybe they can say, oh, they're not, they're not, you know, they were not born in Indonesia. A lot, a lot, of, a lot of things that maybe do not really make sense, but people take it as like it's a truth. Okay, this sounds not very... <laughs> okay, irritating and um, dangerous, you say. Um, let's go to the US, Mike Allen. So, I mean, is it going to be better? I mean, even the big tech giants testified that there are lots of millions of accounts have been exposed to fake news. There was Russian-backed information. There was propaganda, Kremlin propaganda. It's all testified now. And is it somewhere the awareness better? Is it getting better, the fake news situation in the U.S.? No, is the short uh, answer. Uh, but first, I'd like to thank the World Economic Forum for hosting us, and thank you for setting up such a great conversation, and thank all of you for coming out in the middle of the day. What a treat uh, to, talk, to talk to you. I'm very honored uh, to be here. So thank you. The tech giants are more aware of the fake news, but I'm not sure that that's going to mean less of it. So uh, Facebook, which uh, has a house uh, right here uh, on the street between here and the Congress Center, you may have seen it. Uh, it looks uh, wooden. It's a completely sustainable uh, building. But yesterday, uh, they had uh, some journalists over for a reception. And Sheryl Sandberg, the chief operating officer of Facebook, had a conversation there and talked about how aware Facebook now is of what they call false news and underestimated what could be done with the platform. But... Is that really going to stop it? So next time it may be a different actor, someone else behind it. But if you think about Facebook and the point that you made about the chat apps, what do we share? We share something that we feel passionately about. And the headlines that you read, which are very clever and fooled some of us, were likely to feel passionate 
about those. And so that's why fake news often winds up being shared more often than real news, because it touches an emotional cord in us. And that's what we want to do on social media. That's what makes the media social. So as the U.S. looks ahead to our midterm elections this year, in November, we'll elect all 435 of our House members of Congress, and we'll elect one-third of our senators, so 33 senators. As we think ahead to those midterm elections, and very consequential, because uh, right now, President Trump's party, the Republicans, control both the House and the Senate. I think it's likely the Democrats will take over the House, and they could take over the Senate, less likely. But so big stakes in that election, and I think that that's going to mean that these outside actors or people who are going to trying to cause trouble will have an incentive to play once again. And actually, I mean, the symbol of the age of lies is leading the country. I mean, President Trump made, like, according to Washington Post, like, 2,000, over 2,000 false or misleading claims, or it's on average six lies a day. Um, I mean, this, he made this really to a unique selling point, this lying. Well, and what's fascinating... Well, alternative facts, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, some people pick that as the phrase uh, of the year, definitely an Orwellian overtone to that. But, but what's interesting is if you look at the polls in the United States, the people who voted for President Trump, they mostly don't care. So here's an amazing stat, and this comes from a Wall Street Journal NBC News poll, one of our biggest polls. If you voted for Donald Trump in the Republican primary, so when he was running against Jeb Bush and others, if you voted for Donald Trump in the primary and you voted for him in the general election against Hillary Clinton, 99% of you are still with him. So uh, President Trump has a very long leash with the people who elected him. And I think something surprising about his presidency is he hasn't done more to reach out to people who didn't vote for him. I think 54% of people didn't vote for him. And he probably has not added one of those uh, since he was elected to office. But he has kept the people he, he uh, started with. And they just don't care about the statistics that you uh, uh, just shared. Yeah. So, I mean, this is the first step to authori authoritarian style and dictatorship that you don't have to persuade people. You just um, demonstrate them that you have the power over truth. So you create your own truth. I mean, this is well, maybe the slightly, concept. Yeah. We cannot talk about it maybe later, but just uh, let um, Pia Mancini um, add to that because you live now in New York, but how are fake news in <coughs> Argentina or maybe also in the US? I yeah, mean. I mean, Argentina I didn't have um, a, a, a problem with the type of fake news we're discussing. So like, you know, Macedonian powerhouses generating um, fake news. I think we, we need to divide a little bit what's fake news um, used for clickbait and um, to interfere in an election, and fake news used by government as propaganda. So we had a lot of that. We had a lot of, um, in the previous government of Argentina, using media, state-owned or state-supported media very strongly to um, manipulate the public information. Um, so I think that that's another type of fake news which in part I'm, I'm much more concerned about than the you know, Macedonian powerhouses. Um, so we had that um, um, very um, strongly in Argentina, and that's much harder to control because it's state-sponsored, essentially, propaganda. Um, and, and I think that um, going back to um, Anand's point about um, um, uh, Trump mind keeping his base, I think that fake news is not... The, the root of why Trump is in government, I think um, the problem is that Trump was a viable candidate and he still is a viable um, candidate. And that has to do with a decline in institutions and a, um, and a decline of, of trust in our political institutions um, and a decline in how citizens feel represented and, and their problems being addressed by our democracies. Okay, she already raised and challenged the democracy. Um, Alain Berset, um, maybe if you look at, uh, 
she says, of course, there are a lot of government-sponsored news, and that's propaganda as well, and sometimes fake news, we have to watch that as well and take into account. So what would, would you say, how is the fake news situation in Switzerland? Ich glaube, das ist absolut nichts. Well, it's nothing new, ladies and gentlemen. And allow me to just take a moment uh, so that my colleagues can get their headphones on. Um, that will give me the opportunity uh, to say why I've decided to speak German, uh, which is a foreign English, which is a foreign language for me as well, because my mother tongue is German. The reason I'm speaking German is to um, support the diversity we have in Switzerland, to emphasize that. And I'd like also uh, to use it to thank the people of Davos. I know how important it is for us to be here, and I'd like to thank the people of Davos for supporting that. Now, fake news is absolutely nothing new. Nothing new at all. Uh, it's not some kind of new discovery. It does, however, have a new dimension, which is how it is spread, how information is both disseminated and who can produce that information. We used information technology 20 years ago, which required a huge amount of effort to produce and spread information. You had very few such information producers, and there was a kind of uh, code of ethics, if you like. Today, with the means that we have at our disposal, it's completely different. Every individual is a producer of information, and they can spread that information throughout the world. So the situation is completely different. Um, President Macron, we saw on the screen, uh, was saying that we needed a new law to attack fake news. But I think, speaking quite frankly, that that's the wrong approach because you can never really control fake news. What you have to do is invest in how you interpret it. You have to give people the resources they need to be able to properly understand how to distinguish between fake news and real news. And where does that come from? It's in education. And that's where we're investing in education of young people, particularly with regard to social media. There's also the question of what truth is. All of my tweets, for example, are pro-truth. I never tweet anything false. But at the same time, you have to say, well, hold on, it's a bit more nuanced than that, because you have to interpret reality. And you can have different interpretations of reality, which are all valid. Very important to remember that. But however, there is some kind of dividing line, which is when you think or you try that you uh, you try to confuse people in order to reach an objective. If you look at the media in Switzerland, I think we have a relatively good situation, and that's very important, because in a direct democracy, you need a very high level of quality of information. At the same time, we see that this, this, this flow of information uh, does develop. We see a very different situation today than uh, 10 years ago. There's more of a mixture of information with opinion. And it's not clear, for example, if you pick up a newspaper where the news is and where the opinion is. Uh, when I was young, perhaps as young as some of my colleagues here on the podium, it was a lot easier to distinguish between what was information and what was commentary. Not so easy today. So we need to be in a situation where we can distinguish. So education is the answer. So fake news isn't a problem in Switzerland? Well, no, of course, it is a problem. But I don't think that uh, it's a new problem. Uh, it's not like we've discovered fake news overnight. It's always existed. Uh, false information has always been spread. The thing today is that the technology we have for spreading information uh, is completely new. It's in the hands of people who never had it before. So it's a lot more democratic as well. Now, everybody can spread information to the entire world. That's completely new. And it relates, obviously, to technology. But it shows also that technology isn't neutral. Technology itself has an impact. And that's something that we need to fully understand in a direct democracy like Switzerland. So fake news is a problem 
for us. And it's um, it's difficult to sometimes draw the line between what's interpretation and what is what is fake news. Uh, we have to. Can you give an example of that? Drawing the limit. Well, um, f for example, the defeat of the 24th of September and the reform of social insurance in Switzerland. It's a simple example. Many opponents said it's not a problem if you see no. Of course, there's a plan B. It's prepared. Uh, it's ready to get a majority. Um, I wrote that and uh, spread it knowing that it was wrong. Uh, we have the proof of that six months later. Uh, we need to develop it. And um, that kind of information definitely had an impact on the voting and the result. So, saying that it's um, fake news, he, he has to deal with it daily, it's daily business as well, but uh, it's not new, he says. Uh, and actually in South Africa, Iqbal Surve, how is it in, in your country? Firstly, thank you very much for, for inviting me and uh, thank you to all of you for being here. I want to be a little bit um, provocative. Uh, in, in a sense, uh, agreeing with Alain. Uh, I don't think fake news is a new phenomenon. That's the first thing. I think propaganda in various forms has always been there. Uh, the only difference is that it was centralized. It was um, uh, often political or corporate interest that represented uh, media institutions that gave a particular point of view. I was a political activist during apartheid against the apartheid system, and we were up against uh, uh, a system which included the media, which, uh, which misrepresented uh, you know, the views of the majority of the people. So I don't, I don't think fake news is anything new. The second point to make is that um, I don't also believe, fake news has become very prominent with Donald Trump, <laughs> but I don't believe that there's a linear relationship between the two. Now, of course, Donald Trump tweets a lot of fake news, but that's not the point. The point is, was Donald Trump elected because of fake news? And I don't think that has been unpacked properly. So, so whatever he says or doesn't say, does it have an impact on people or not? I think the third point, which, he, which this debate frames um, somewhat, I, I, I would say, uh, wrongly, is that it doesn't give ordinary people the benefit of the doubt. People are not stupid. I mean, people sitting in this room are not stupid. I know some of you may not have answered those questions, but, but because they phrase in a particular way. The reality is every single person can sense the difference between what is real and not real. And, uh, and, and you can make that decision based on a number of factors. So people sitting in this room, of course, you're going to get, you're going to get gossip, you're going to get propaganda, you're going to get fake news. But ultimately, you'll be able to make that decision because um, you understand what's going on. The, the, the last point I want to make, and this is the point about Africa, is that fake news should be seen in a contextual, rational way. In other words, whatever news you have, whatever news you receive, must be in the context of where you are, whether it's in relation to a job, in relation to the environment, in relation to being employed, etc. Africa itself at the moment, fake news in, in the way, the way it's, uh, it, it's described in the US certainly, uh, isn't that big a phenomenon because Africans are concerned with the issues of poverty, issues of uh, corruption, issues of dealing with conflict, uh, issues of just improving their lives. I mean, the majority of um, people on the African continent are like you, young people under the age of 35. In fact, Africa is the continent with the most young people under the age of 35. So the issue isn't so much, you know, the fake news. The issue is, are we able to provide people with news, with information, with knowledge, with skills, which is relevant to themselves and relevant to them being able to improve their lives and the lives of their communities? So. Fake news, you know, if we think of fake news purely in a strategic sense that, hey, here's fake news, it's a problem, that's not going to solve the problem. Fake news has to be seen in the context of the overall ecosystem. 
in which people are operating in. And if you fix the overall ecosystem, and I think someone mentioned it, a lot of that ecosystem is trust. Fake news only thrives because there's a trust deficit between powerful institutions, whether they are in government or whether they are in the private sector, or for that matter sometimes in, uh, in, 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 in diffused uh, uh, networked organizations. So it's trust that must come back between people, and you build trust by addressing the needs of people. So I think fake news will come and go. I think once Donald Trump comes and goes, fake news will become uh, less, less, of a, less of an issue. I mean, this sounds really nice and optimistic, but actually critics say, I'm not sure. I think this side is a little bit downplaying fake news, really, because there are like people saying, um, we really have to see this as cyber attacks now. This are US hack, the US election have been hacked. I mean, there is obviously uh, was like a Russian hacked election, and we have a lot of proof by that. And it's not only that it's, I mean, of course, it's not a new. Uh, it's not new. Everyone agrees. We have always had like propaganda and all that stuff. But isn't there like um, more this the reach, the algorithms now that they take unfair advantage of all the algorithms now? I mean, fakes are sexier than facts. So you click it, you post it, you share it, and you just um, the reach is unbelievable, and the time is crucial. It spreads all over. And this is now, for a lot, for a lot of um, companies now, this becomes a cyber security matter. Fake news are not just fake news. And I'm, I'm not sure, maybe uh, um, this side um, sees it more dangerous, as I got the, maybe, M Mike, you wanted to add something? Yeah, thank you. And uh, I agree with the uh, cyber security point. What you hear... Uh, politicians in America are saying a lot is that if we had been, uh, if the U.S. had been physically attacked, if there had been uh, either uh, a military attack or even if our power grid or our communications grid had been affected, there would be much more of a response where, as people here have said, uh, arguably the election was hacked and people see it as more abstract, less real, less solid. And as a result of that, uh, you'll find that uh, the states and the federal government have taken less action than you might have thought, that the state governments have taken less action to protect the polling places because all of our elections are done at the state level. So people uh, in uh, Virginia, where I live, the election for president is run uh, by Virginia. Uh, uh, very little has been done or much less has been done that you might think by the states to prevent this. And uh, certainly the federal government hasn't mobilized the way you think that they might have. And you heard people in the U.S. blaming President Obama partly for this, that, that some of the uh, hacking was known in the fall while he was still president, uh, but that uh, he was slow to respond partly because he didn't want to interfere uh, with the election. But that was the failure of imagination, not treating it, as you say, with, as a cybersecurity issue. So they should take it more um, serious, the problem, the message. What would you say? Well, um, the, for instance, the way the government of Indonesia responds to this issue is that um, they just recently created a cyber crime agency um, in a way that basically they're trying to um, monitor uh, not only the media, but even the conversation of the people, and I think that is dangerous as well because that it means we're we're getting into you know the issue of privacy, the issue of you know um, data security and all that. Um, so I think we also need to be able to respond to this issue delicately uh, and not just see it as a you know uh, like other issues. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I have yeah. to agree here. Um, I think that the the danger of the fake news, um, you know, the election was hacked is a cybersecurity issue. The country was attacked. Um, the state should have protected the polling stations. I think that um, I mean, it's unclear to me at what level the, the polling stations were hacked by fake news. I mean, that's not entirely clear what the states could have done there. But I think that the risk with that is, is, is you know, to support his point, saying like, all right, so what actions do we take? Do we monitor more? Do we raise the surveillance? Do we, um, you know, have more, more data? Are governments going to be 
monitoring what we say, the traffic that goes, um, what actions are, are, are they going to take. And at the same time, fueling this, this idea that fake news is responsible, and I'm sorry to go back to this, but fueling this idea that fake news is responsible for um, having populist governments around the world, I think um, it's, it's a distraction from focusing on what we really need to focus about, that it's what's going on with our democracies around the world. Right? And so we're, we're immersed in this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy at the same time, because the more we talk about fake news, the, the less people are going to trust news, obviously. And then at the same time, the more we talk about fake news in the context of, of an attack of a country, and then we're giving people like the President of the United States more tools to, um, to use to smear publications or news that are real, but he just simply doesn't like. Right? So I, I, would, I, would, I would just urge everyone to be extremely cautious when we talk about these issues and when, and when we, we blame fake news for putting Trump as, as president of the United States. Thomas Jefferson, third president of the United States, already said information is the currency of democracy. And if we have now misinformation, this this information, I mean, is this the beginning of the end of democracy? I mean, you raised the question. I, I, by no means, I think this is the beginning of the end of, of democracy. I do think that the, the misinformation issue is an issue that we, we can address. I think we can address it. I don't think it's, um, it's the end of democracy by, by any means of, of consideration. I think it's a problem. I think we need to look at it. I think there's a, a couple of, you know, more than a couple of ideas around about how to manage um, this. Um, I, I would, I would prefer the ideas that do not involve the state regulating <laughs> news or information. Um, but, but again, but, but I think that the core problem of why we are having populist leaders emerge around the world, of why we have uh, demagogues in government, it's not a problem of fake news, it's a problem of the institutions that we have. And I think that that's, where, that's the conversation that I think we need to be having. I mean, and it's, of course, um, you're also influenced by your country because there is not a um, situation than in Switzerland. I checked the World Press Freedom Index of your, all of your countries. And, I mean, there are big, big um, differences. So Switzerland is leading there, of course. It's ranked seven from un 180 countries, 180th is North Korea, and uh, Switzerland is on rank seven. South Africa is on is the second ranked, is on 31st. Then US is behind South Africa and Switzerland, it's 43rd. And Argentina is even behind the US, so it's 50th. And um, then we have Indonesia, catastrophe, far, far behind. Yeah. I mean, this is... Um, I mean, there you don't have, actually, you don't have to have censorship if you have editors like in Indonesia. Well, Just uh, to say, to be provocative. All right. uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, it is much better than, you know, 10 years ago. Even 10 years ago, it's, it's way, way worse. But I think I also like to touch upon, you know, your, your previous questions, whether basically fake news is a danger towards the democracy, is that the end of democracy. Um, I, I agree that it's not necessarily means that it's the end of the democracy, but it is it gives a danger of democracy because I believe that democracy is contingent upon uh, informed citizens. And we don't have informed citizens even 10 years ago. But, but with the fake news, then it's, it becomes you know, much more um, you know, difficult. Uh, because if the citizens are not informed, then they cannot make good decisions. right? Um, then, so for instance, if the data point is wrong, then how are you going to select a good leader, for instance, during the election uh, season? Um, so that's the first one. But my second point is that, um, aligned with what Pia has uh, mentioned before as well, is that it, it, it alienates us from, from what really matters, from, from, the, from, from the truth, from, from what the issue that, is, that we should really talk about. And I think that brings um, you know, uh, difficulty in terms of like, how we are going to engage the public, how we are going to mobilize the people for social goods, for the issues that really matter. And the third one is that, let's say, by calling the you know, press agency or media as a, as a, let's say, fake news distributor, for me, it also undermines the legitimacy of, of, of a credible institution, of genuine reporting. And, and the problem with that is that if we undermine the organization that is so important for democracy, then who are we going to rely on? Who are we going to trust? And that creates a lot of problems with the public as well. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think it's uh, good to react for Alain Berset. Um, yeah, who do we trust in? How can we find yeah. trust again in the institutions and rely on what? Zuerst einmal, ich wollte auch noch etwas. Well, first of all, I wanted to say something about the impression that we've perhaps given with my colleague here uh, that we might be underestimating the scale of the problem. We're not. It's wrong to say that. Um, we shouldn't underestimate it, but also we shouldn't overstate it, at least on the side of uh, information. Allow me to explain this um, a little bit better. I think that we need to have a structured debate on this. Um, there's a difference between fake news on the one hand and cybersecurity on the other hand. And, but there are critics who say that, that these are terrorist attacks uh, promoting the geopolitical interests of countries like Russia. Well, if you let me get to the end of what I'm trying to explain. In the past, there have been many examples of elections, for example, in the 90s or before, where a president was elected with something like 99% of the popular vote. Now, that was prior to this whole discussion about fake news. So that's got nothing to do with fake news, not fake news, cybersecurity, not cybersecurity. That is about manipulation of elections, and that's been with us uh, for a very long time. Sometimes you can spot it, sometimes you can't, but we've lived with it for a long time. And now um, the potential has got greater because with electronic voting you can have new forms of manipulation. Now the same applies when we're discussing fake, discussing fake news. And we've always lived with false information propaganda. That has a lot to do with the development and the holding on uh, to power. Now that had its own technology and today that technology has changed. If you mix up these ideas of cybersecurity and fake news um, then, well, yes, you, you can spread information to pursue certain ends. And it's quite possible that in another country there are official web pages that open, uh, that spread fake information, and which influence what's happening elsewhere. But allow me to emphasize again, this is not an invention of the 21st century. That's something that has been done for a long time, but different means are being used now as a result of digitalization. So I think in order to understand that, we need to recognize that difference. There's a question about information and the quality of information and cybersecurity and the consequences of living in a digitalized world. Today, in Switzerland, it's extremely important because we don't just have elections every four or five years. Four or five times a year, we have votes on the most important issues facing the country because we are a direct democracy. And it's very important, therefore, for us to look into these issues. We need strong structures and reliable media. We need diversity of media which reflects different worldviews and which all take the principle of good information being important as a central principle. Down a little bit, so it's, um, you take it serious and look at it. I think, isn't it a real problem also because it's economically such a good thing to produce fake news. Fakes are much more sexy than facts. Yeah. So, I mean, this is really, this is something, the business model, and they take unfortunate advantage of all these business models and algorithms in social media, because um, you earn with, fa with fake news as well, because you click, share, like it, and you, you earn with every click. So isn't it this business aspect also the dangerous part about fake news? Yeah, no, I, I think that we do take it seriously. It's just that we contextualize it everything. What, what we're saying is that there's a context to everything and the solution to this issue has to be far more comprehensive than simply trying to use um, cyber security or specific methods to, to stop fake news. 
The, 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 the point I want to make, and, and I agree very much with what Elena said, um, is that um, you're not going to stop fake news. It's like trying to stop the Internet. The technology has given you the ability to disseminate information far more quicker and far more effectively than at any other point in the history of humankind. I'm a medical doctor, just to, just to give you some background. I trained at the, one of the top universities in the world, did the world's first heart transplant, Cape Town University. Um, and my medical training is based on what we call evidence-based medicine or scientific-based medicine. But it doesn't stop thousands of people that are not scientifically trained from claiming to heal you, claiming to do all sorts of things to you. And over the ages, many people... Sometimes we call them cracks. Sometimes people put tea leaves there. Sometimes they throw bones. Sometimes they just talk about things, you know, make smoke and all these things. And they tell you they can heal you. And over time you discover that they can't heal you. That in fact there is no science to what they are doing. In some cases it may well be therapeutic because mentally it helps you. I'm a firm believer that the issue is not fake news. The issue is trust. And trust must be established between media organizations and the public. And you establish that trust by, con by doing evidence or scientifically based news. In other words, you always tell the truth. And if you tell the truth properly and you contextualize the truth, then over time people will begin to believe in what you're saying. If you don't tell the truth, if you try and write propaganda, if you try and disseminate propaganda, if you try and represent only certain interests and you don't declare the fact that you, that you are representing those interests, then the public will in fact reject you. I think fake news is a phenomenon which is good for us. You know why? It's excellent because it means that increasingly we're going to have to examine who we are. Historically, powerful institutions like the media, like governments, like other institutions um, had it carte blanche. They could say whatever they wanted to say because they had the power. Today, people are questioning that power. And, and fake news has caused people to question that power. And that is why it's up to us to reestablish the trust between the media and the public and the readers and, and others out there. So I think fake news is, is, a, is an important um, pressure point, inflection point, for us to reflect on who we are and the kind of world we want to have, the kind of society we want to have, and the kind of dialogue we want to have in this world today. And, and that's why I'm, I'm very optimistic, and young people like yourselves sitting here today, you are not going to be fooled by fake news. You're going to think about it, you're going to put it into context, you're going to discuss it, you just have a different way of doing it. But certainly, you're not going to be fooled by it. So fake news are a good thing because it makes you think and yeah, ask more. And actually, this is a good point um, to open up the discussion now um, the, with the audience, to engage with the audience. I mean, we're still with a part of the problems, risks and threats of fake news and misinformation. Um, does anyone have a question? There are questions. The middle over there. Hello, my name is Simon, and I'd like to ask Mr. Allen. We live in an age where sensational headlines and the sorts of fake news often go hand in hand with reality. Would the idea of a purely factual um, news outlet with that clearly states its sources be realistic, or is that something that just isn't possible? No, Simon. Thank you for Simon, right? Yeah. Uh, thank you for that uh, question. Are you from Davos, or where are you from? Um, from Prague, Czech Republic. Oh, terrific. Uh, well, so appreciate your having you here. And yes, it's possible uh, to have a news organization that you can trust that's just based on facts, and it's called Axios. Uh, it's uh, uh, the website that we just started, and I say that um, because I apply this also to the other news organizations on this stage, and and to take the point that fake news causes us to re-examine ourselves, which I liked that. It also creates an opportunity for news organizations that uh, will be fair to both sides, that will explain both sides, that will stick to just the facts. So uh, our website, which is called Axios, A-X, 
iOS, and it means worthy in Greek. And we have a feature that's called Facts Matter. And the idea behind that is there are some things that are just true. There are some things that you don't have to argue about. And too little of that is, an exhi is exhibited in the media these days. The other end of that telescope, though, is that for our journalists, that means there's even more responsibility on you to be worthy of that trust. So a small example of that. Are there any uh, journalism students or, or journalists uh, here in the audience? Uh, something that we talk to our young journalists about is that if you think about your everyday life, no one's all good or all bad. Very few things are all black or all white. And so when we read something that portrays someone as all good or all bad or portrays uh, something in a very binary way, we don't trust it because it doesn't comport with our life experience. Similarly, we teach our journalists that if you have the other side in your story, that makes people trust your story more. Young journalists sometimes think, oh, if I, if I give the other side their say, it will undermine my point. No, the opposite is true, that if you give both sides their say, if you explain the facts, then our audience will trust us more. So there's definitely an opportunity in this world, but also more of a responsibility uh, for us uh, to be worthy of that trust that we're trying to get. Thank you for the questions. Are there yes, any Simon, more questions question. here and maybe here in front as well? I've seen one. The, the, um, the lady in the middle there? Or I just saw here in the, in the middle. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, my name is Alva, um, and I'm from County Baden. And my question would be, there's also a thing called micro-targeting, so that um, different parties only provide their information to uh, their potential voters. And would you say that this is also fake information or fake news? Maybe it's something from Alain Perse and his socialist party. Um, do you use a micro-targeting as well as political party? And, or how is it used? Yeah, I have it as well for him. Yes, I have. Um, it's been um, talked about. But there has to be a dividing line. Um, you need to recognize that um, you can't talk about everything to everybody in a democracy. What I would like is to have a situation where you do feel you can talk about everything, but um, you have to prioritize some issues. So um, in, in that sense, you do prioritize information. Now, if you put that in the context of micro-targeting, uh,
there was also allegations of uh, targeting fake news directly at specific individuals who were vulnerable to it. So how can we ensure that that doesn't happen here in our election campaigns? Well, first of all, I have to say that I probably have not nearly enough information on this kind of technology to be able to give a detailed answer. But what I can say is that we have probably better protection in Switzerland against these kind of phenomena. And that's because of our federal structure, the involvement of local communities, the very strong decentralization that we have. The result of that is that we know who we are. We have 2,500 communities. Uh, we have some major cities, uh, Zurich with half a million people, which you can't really compare with the biggest cities in the world, which are 60 to 100 times larger. And in a um, city, it's perhaps more difficult to stay in close contact with people. And I believe that our contact, the contact between individuals, uh, is a factor in limiting the spread of such information. Um, now, I know that there is uh, IT technology which uh, is capable of disseminating false information. The best way of countering that is by making that information uh, information available to the public, revealing it, uh, reporting on it. And your generation, the young generation, uh, are going to have to deal with it. I see this with my kids because the, they are born into a world where fake news is a phenomenon. And they are fully aware of the need to identify the quality of their sources of information. Now, when I was young, everything that you read in the newspaper was the absolute truth. I would never have had the idea to cast doubt upon that. So we live in a different world. And the generation that is growing up is used to this phenomena. We who have seen these developments uh, come about also need to contribute to ensuring that uh, everybody is aware of them. But as I say, uh, trust is the key issue, and I don't think it's a dramatic issue in Switzerland. Analytica, because they did psychological targeting. If they can analyze you, if you have um, share like 40 likes, then they can analyze you in like six different types, and they did that. And is there anyone more into this Cambridge Analytica? Maybe Mike Allen, do you know the techniques they did or sure. <laughs> excuse me, I would just generalize this mm -hmm. to marketers of all sorts are gonna use increasingly sophisticated targeting more and more marketers are able to match our online identity with our uh, real identity. Often they can now match up your um, social networks with your email, can uh, uh, match up uh, a cookie on your browser with your real identity. So we're only going to be targeted more and more. I just want to pick up on one point, and I so agreed with your point about uh, understanding uh, the sources and the, the importance of education about sources. I think I talked to my nieces and nephews, and they think news comes from Facebook. And you have to stop and think about the fact that it, news that I'm getting from The Economist on Facebook is very different from uh, news that I may be getting from The Guardian uh, on Facebook or from uh, some uh, source that we haven't maybe heard of. When I was growing up, there was a kid on our street who was named Scott, and Scott was kind of a dope, and he didn't know what a cow was, and he thought that milk came from the grocery store. And that's how I feel when I listen to people who think that news comes from Facebook. So it's, respons it's our responsibility uh, both in our own lives and also for young people who uh, we uh, have the uh, responsibility, the opportunity to guide, the importance of, of knowing what the source is and whether you're seeing it on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or on uh, a chat app, to know where our information is coming from uh, because that is going to be the weapon against fake news. Like, like there's always going to be fancier new targeting techniques, fancier new ways to do fake news, 
Um, and that's why having organizations you can trust and paying attention to them is going to be so important for news consumers in the future. Thank you. And I've seen there is an urgent question as well. <laughs> uh, hi, thank you for taking my question. Basically, do you consider uh, fake news as, uh, would you treat it the same as free speech? Do you consider it free speech? And if so, isn't it counterproductive to kind of ban fake news? Because uh, for every healthy democracy, free speech is like the pillar. And also, when we talk about fake news, how come we're not talking about big corporations like CNN or Fox News? who really spread fake news on an almost daily basis. And for example, I consider the whole Russia story fake news, so. So even if um, Facebook and Zuckerberg testified it and, and, to, and took it into court, um, I mean, this is some, yeah, of course, uh, that is some conspiracy theory a lot. Um, I would say, like, I mean, he says, but it's a good, I mean, it's a good thing, way of thinking. Is it kind of a form of art, even? I mean, just to create <laughs> fake news. And, I mean, fake news are really creative. Yeah. So it's nice to be creative, yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. uh, expression of freedom of speech. I mean, he's challenging our vision. Would you, re would you like to respond? Yeah, I get it. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I'd like to. And I think that this is an extremely interesting conversation because the um, freedom of expression, freedom of speech is a key part of democracy. Yes, it is a uh, fundamental part of uh, civil life. You need to be able to talk about uh, many things. And in, in Parliament, we have immunity even, uh, which protects us and enables us to say absolutely anything. At the same time, however, we need to recognize that democracy depends on the quality of information. So if you say, well, yeah, hold on, fake news is a kind of cultural development, it's kind of happening, an art form, um, it's an interesting view, but it's quite hazardous for democracy. Once again, uh, the central question here is being able to recognize uh, the structure of conversation that we need to have. Um, because if you recognize what fake news is and you place it in, its, in a context of, say, an exhibition or a study of fake news, that's not the same information as finding fake news in the middle of a newspaper or on your Facebook page. So once again, uh, Trust is important, the context is important, and the, the place of dissemination is important. If uh, you want to understand uh, fake news, you need to understand these phenomena. And um, fake news has always existed in conversation as well. If you go into the pub or a bar, you're likely to hear people talking about conspiracy theories, etc. But now we have this new way of spreading. Fine. May I ask our friend, just because I'm curious, in what sense do you feel like the Russia story is fake news? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, in the sense that it sort of feels like it's more based on sensationalism rather than anything else, like facts or actual proof. And there haven't been any indictments so far, so uh, no one really knows where that is going. I mean... Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah? Um, <laughs> um, um, I thought you were going to take that out. No, no, I'm just curious because, uh, like, I don't think that it's been uh, disputed that Russian accounts uh, used uh, through Facebook uh, distributed information that wasn't accurate. So I was just curious. You're, I, I take your point. That's all. I was just curious. Yeah. Um, um, so... Um, I'm not entirely sure how you can ban fake news, and I think that, that what you're saying is, is, is exactly, it, it, is kind of, uh, it shows our, my, my concern with all this conversation, that is two things. The first one is banning fake news, which is very, very close to banning news, right? And who's going to be the censor of that? Who, who's going to have the authority 
to say what's what's truth or or or, or fake. Um, I think that's a consequence of, 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 of this also. That's my concern. And my second concern with that is um, with the whole fake news conversation is like now everything can be fake, right? You just don't believe in something, so it's fake news. Well, I, I, I don't know. I get that there's, you know, there's been a lot of, of um, <laughs> there's a, um, an investigation, special investigation happening in the United States at the moment regarding this issue. Um, that Robert Mueller is um, taking on. So I think that there is more than, gr more than enough grants to, of, of concern, but now w you know, we can just say that anything that we don't like is, is fake news, and I have a big problem with that, because I think that that undermines the very little trust that we have left in society, and it's, we keep undermining um, institutions, we keep undermining um, information, and I, that, in my mind, that is the real problem. And so, yeah. Looks like it's the real problem. So do we have one last question and then we go to the solution part. There's so many questions. Maybe we take one. I don't want to, I'm not the censorship here. <laughs> so whoever, the microphone's next. Maybe a woman. A woman, yeah. I would, is there, there is a woman. Yeah, there is a woman. Thank you. Hi, I was wondering if you think schools um, should play a role in teaching young people how to distinguish real news from fake news, yes. and um, if they should, how effective you think that might be? I think you made this point as well, mm -hmm. that it should be very uh, important in schools, education. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to emphasize or add? Yeah, can I? Yes, I'd like to. It's a very important question. We've developed a response in Switzerland, which, do you, do you understand German? Okay. So yeah, what we've done is um, at the cantonal level, we've developed a program called Youth and Media. And we're trying to support that. Now, at the moment, it's far too small. Uh, it needs to be made a lot stronger. Um, and I'm sure it will be in the future because I think that's where the real solution lies. I think the technical approach of blocking fake news is not only extremely difficult, it also ex uh, can be seen as a limitation of the freedom of expression, which um, can be applied not only to fake news but might limit genuine freedom of speech. So I think that we need to equip young people to be able to operate in this world and distinguish between what's true and what isn't. Um, if I read uh, something on Facebook and see the uh, one source is The Economist and one source is a dubious individual, well, I need to be able to distinguish between those two to recognize which sources I trust, etc., etc., and that requires uh, education and discussion like the one that we're having now. This discussion is very helpful, I believe, in wearing, wearing, raising awareness. We um, arrived at the second part of the question. Um, of the debate. We heard about solutions already. You said in education, in schools, we have to start earlier. Are there any other solutions to tackle that? I mean, we heard regulation. You said no regulation. This is, I think, you made a point already. Well, a slight nuance. Um, unfortunately, this will be my last uh, contribution because I have to run off now. I won't be able to be with you for the last quarter of an hour because uh, I haven't been able to rearrange things. Uh, so thank you very much for your understanding. We heard President Macron saying we should have a law and uh, that should be dealt with at the government national level. That's extremely complicated. So it's quite easy to say, yes, we can do this. I'm, I'm not sure whether that's true. I think what's far more effective is the idea of citizen empowerment. How can you give people the means to do this themselves and to be able to distinguish between what's fake and what isn't? I am very interested in what we can do with education in this regard. Thank you very much, you. Alain Berset. Mm -hmm. He has, he has to leave now. 
Are you going as well? Yeah, thank you so much. No, you have to go too. So and he has to leave now. He's so um, meeting President Trump. It's, <laughs> it's, not, it's fake news. <laughs> don't, don't be bothered. It's, it's fake news. But it's, we, do, we didn't find out. They're very secretive. So. I was also invited to the meeting of President Trump, but I declined. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just um, to add the point with regulation, as he said, this is crazy. This, this is not going to stop fake news, um, these laws. I mean, Germany has already a law. This is kind of against um, hate content in um, social media content, etc. And, of course, we heard President Macron, he is planning as well like a law. I don't think you can regulate fake news. That's the first thing. It's a bit like marijuana, cannabis. People tried for decades to regulate it, and all of you smoke it. So, so the point is, the point is that, that over time you learn it can be beneficial. You know, when I was a young doctor, and there was a professor of neuroscience who said that marijuana can be used for cancers and for helping patients, she was she was really pillared by the mainstream medical fraternity and the media, uh, Professor Frances Ames. And today, she's been proven to be correct that you can use marijuana or cannabis for uh, cancer therapy alleviation and those kind of things. So I think over time, you, you know, what I want to say to young people in particular is that you are not, you are not technologically impotent. In other words, don't believe that because technology is there, it makes you not have power. You have immense power. You can decide what is fake news and what is not fake news. And I always remember uh, the statement from uh, both uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu, who won the Nobel Prize for Peace, and, and, and President Mandela. They both used to say this very famous thing. They said that, look, a knife is a tool. And the knife is a tool that can be used to cut a loaf of bread and you can distribute the pieces or slices to lots of people to feed them. Or a knife is a tool that can be used to kill somebody. You can decide how you want to use that tool. You can't ban knives because it can kill somebody. It's the same analogy. You cannot ban fake news because it's like banning the internet. It's not going to happen. You know, Macron and others are going to try this and they're going to come up with regulation after regulation. Eventually they're going to realize the answer is not in, in, in regulating fake news. The answer is in building trust. The answer is in citizens taking ownership of, of themselves and, and, and realizing the power you have to the, to the young man in the red T-shirt. If someone micro, micro takes you, I think you said it is, with fake news, stand up and say... If your party microtags me with fake news, I will never vote for you again. And if every single young person says, if you send us fake news by microtagging us, we will never vote for your party again. That is the most important statement you can ever make. The last point, because Donald Trump has arrived, I've got to make this point. Okay? Mm. Donald Trump was not elected because of fake news. I think that is fake news. Mm. Donald Trump was elected because there was no viable candidate in America that could connect with ordinary people and could address the concerns of ordinary people in America. That is why he got elected. And people no longer trusted the establishment media. They no longer trusted corporate interest. And that, that, that trust deficit resulted in people voting Donald Trump into power. And that's what we've got to focus on. And... Sometimes media owners, like myself, and um, publishers and big corporate interests are like um, young children having tantrums. They had all the power over the last few decades. They had all the power to control the news over the last few decades. Institutions had the great power. Now suddenly, that power no longer exists. And suddenly they're trying to regulate that power again. That's not going to work. The way to actually make yourself relevant in this day and age is to be balanced, is to be fair, tell the truth, tell both sides of the story, inform readers, and then you build the trust and people will begin to be able to understand what is fake and what is real.
I wish this vision could, could become true, but I'm not sure if everybody can really tell and detect. Even journalists, it's really hard to detect false from true f um, fakes. So is it really so easy that it's all relied on our self-responsibility? I think it's going to be um, like a, a mixture of um, ways to address this. Um, I, I, I couldn't agree more, I think, that we also, we as citizens need to take responsibility and ownership in our, our, our role and, and step up sure. to this and, um, and use our common sense to, to be able to, to see through what they're trying to do and, and to understand what's uh, real and what's fake. Um, so that's a big part of it. But, but, but I agree with you as well that, that there are other things that, that can help and might not be always that easy to... Um, so from a technical perspective, I, I think that this is a problem. Part of this problem is going to be solved by the large um, uh, platform companies like Facebook or Google that algorithms are going to be able to detect very quickly if a newspaper source is real or is in, in, the, you know, in the United States or is in Macedonia. Right? That's going to happen very quickly. So that kind of fake news is going to be debunked and it's going to be brought down from the internet, I think, rather quickly. So, um, and, and, uh, and, the pressure, and the pressure is big on them, the te on the tech giants. Absolutely, so, yeah. and they're taking stock of it. And they are, they are absolutely um, trying to address this issue. It's, it's complex for them because on, they don't want to be perceived as a media company because then they would be regulated as a media company. And they are kind of model is that they're not a media company, that they're a platform, so they're not responsible for the content that they have, but they are taking stock of this and they are um, taking steps towards um, doing this. So I think that on the one hand, algorithms are going to be able to help solve a part of this, of this problem. Um, and then the other big part of the, of, of the issue has to do with the ad revenue model in media. Right? As long as clicks are, we pay for clicks, okay. we're going to keep having this problem. So I think that um, you know, another part of that has to be with um, how do we go to maybe a subscription model for, for media where clicks are not what is bringing them money, but the advertising model that the internet is, um, has and, and media relies on so heavily, um, I think that's part of, 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 of the problem as well and needs to be part of the solution. Reviewing business models needs to be part of, of the solution. Um, and then last but not least, I think it's a combination of um, citizen journalism and citizen fact checkers organized in what, like um, the project that Jimmy Wells has of uh, Wiki Tribune, right? And so having a sort of Wikipedia kind of um, system <coughs> where journalists work together with citizens that are fact checkers that are um, analyzing this information and uh, you know, uh, giving it, um, assessing the validity or the veracity of it. So I think it's a combination of different things. But I think that, oh, and the last thing that I'm going to say um, that I, I think will, will improve this um, you know, fake news situation, it has to do with um, supporting local news organizations. Local news organizations are still one of the most trusted institutions, um, at least in the United States. And they're way more trusted than um, national sort of big media companies. So supporting local news organizations, I think, is also a big chunk of how we can address this. So it's a big mixture, and uh, I think um, of measures taken and responsibilities. And with Imam, can misinformation be like handled with even more technology, like blockchain or so, that we somehow find a way to verify the sources and just to handle that? Well, I, I believe we're we are getting there, but I think I would like to emphasize as well that um, I think we need to treat this issue very delicately that we have to spread the importance of critical thinking uh, you know, matters more than ever. So we need to approach every single information with more critical approach as well. And so basically as a responsible citizen, we need to be able to be responsible with whatever we consume and what we share. And I think taking more uh, practical approach in terms of how we are going to solve this problem, I think we, we, we are not only talking about how we prevent this to happen, but I think it's also very important for us to touch upon how we are going to, um, you know, to, to solve 
the, the, the impact or the consequence of the fake news itself. So for instance, we're from where I'm coming from, where the communities are already divided, then how are we going to build trust again? How are we going to um, you know, basically rebuild the, the uh, connection among the people? And I think, um, just to give an example, that's I think what we're doing as well at Ruang Guru. So um, we're running an um, education um, uh, platform currently consumed by uh, 6.5 million students in Indonesia. And what we're doing is that aside of you know, all the math, physics, science, and all the you know, subjects that students are learning, we're also trying to uh, bring, um, to, to even, even frame the content to also um, expose the students with diversity. Because most of the students in Indonesia, for instance, they're, they get used to with seeing people uh, with the same color, with the same you know, race and all that. And I think by giving them exposure to new content um, like that... filter bubbles, you... Sorry, you, you refer to filter bubbles or echo chambers, yeah. so that you always mean that is true. Mingle. And and I think that is a responsibility not only for the government, but I think for everybody um, who has you know it's it's our responsibility. Yeah. Actually, um, we're running out of time already. Is there um, anything or questions concerning like solutions and how we can solve it? Yeah, over there. Uh, yes, you said we have to be responsible while consuming the news. And you also said that uh, we can ban fake news. But don't you think fake news is an exploitation of freedom of speech? Because so just because you have a freedom of speech doesn't mean you can say whatever you want to. And when you're in such a responsible position of giving news to the whole world, and when you know that these people have trust in you, you, you can't. why don't you make those people responsible for giving the right the right news instead of the false news, instead of us becoming responsible to consume the right news. Because what are we going to refer to when we, uh, when we think something is fake? What are we going to refer to? We might as well refer to other fake news, right? So don't you think it's an exploitation of freedom of speech? I think you raise a really important point. Um, there is a blurred line increasingly between freedom of speech and regulation of speech or fake news, uh, truth, uh, all of these things, they are, they are very blurred these days, partly because the speed at which information gets disseminated. So people don't have time to process it. But at the end of the day, you have a choice. You really do. As long as you realize you have the choice, and you have a choice to educate yourself, you have a choice to understand what's going on, you have a choice to only support those institutions, be it media, academic, or others, that tell you the truth all the time consistently. You know that you can lie to some people some of the time, you can't lie to them all the time. So eventually, over time, give yourself the benefit of the doubt. Don't be so hard on yourself, okay? You can make this choice. Don't allow people to believe that technology um, uh, can make you uh, impotent, or because algorithms, who decides what's fake news, by the way? I mean, because fake news it's, itself is not just complete lies. It's a mixture of a bit of truth and a, and a bit of lies. I always like quoting the very famous philosopher. Some of you might know him, uh, Bob Marley. <laughs> and um, he used to say and sing, in fact, um, uh, none, but of us, none but ourselves can free our minds. Mm. You all remember that, right? Mm. So that's what life is about, you know. You have power. You have the ability to reason. You have the ability to think. It doesn't matter how rich you are, how poor you are, what color you are, what religion you are, where you come from, man or woman or whatever you are. At the end of the day, you have got power. And when you recognize that you have power, you have the ability to choose what news you're going to consume, what news you're going to believe. You also have the ability to decide what you want to distribute and what you want to, to say um, to others. And... Um, I think when you have power, you also realize that um, you will not abuse that power. Because, because power to make decisions is the most... You know, democracy evolves. I mean, I listen to people say, well, democracy um, is in danger because of fake news. No, no, no. Democracy is not in danger because of fake news. Democracy has evolved because we live in a network society. We, li we live in a devolved society. A society where a few people no longer have the power to make all the decisions anymore. They can try, but they'll, they'll have immense resistance if they try and do that. And, and because of that, democracy must evolve. 
And democracy must take a different shape. And the kind of shape that democracy will take is, is wonderful for democracy because people are going to become more informed and the ability to be able to differentiate between that which is false and that which is truth. I'm very hopeful about the future. I made, made the point earlier that fake news is an inflection point in our society for the media in particular because it means that um, people are going to want to – we are going to have to get the trust back from people. We as the media are going to have to examine ourselves because the media is – you know, if you go back 30 years, it's not a long time. There were cigarettes, cigarette adverts in huge newspapers from the New York Times, by the way, various other major newspapers of the world, which said that if you smoked a cigarette, you'll live longer. If you smoked a cigarette, you'll have a wonderful life. If you smoke the cigarette, you'll get more friends. And if you smoke the cigarette, you'll be more beautiful. Now, that was 30, 40 years ago. And those were big adverts if you smoke a camel you know, you'll become like a major star or something, right? These were the things. So fake news has always existed. But over time, science, evidence space, facts, truth will always, you know, always dominate the, 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 the sort of uh, so, uh, social sphere, if you like. People will eventually understand lies or they'll differentiate between the lies and the truth. But that's the power you have. And if there's one message I want to give, right? It's a long Ev message. Just one <laughs> short message. is that everybody is making a noise about fake news. What you mustn't forget, you have the power to decide yourselves whether news is fake or truth. Iqbal, it sounds all, always so wonderful easy if you explain it to us. But it just last question to the audience. Who feels like influenced and who feels powerful? So hands up, who feels influenced? Mm -hmm. And who feels powerful? And who feels powerful? Oh, okay. More feels powerful. So, so very helpful. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful picture. I should have pictured it and yeah. we should have posted it here up. More people feel powerful together as they're powerful. I would like to thank you. You've been a wonderful audience, really. Thank you for all the questions. <laughs> and of course, Thank you so much, dear participants, for this lively debate, for provocative thoughts, and thank you, and for giving us some courage and vision for the, for the post-truth era. Thank you very much. Thank you.